I'm Paul Pantone, inventor of Geek Technology. Uh, the workshop today is going to be about an hour and a half long. We're going to be running a small engine and uh, generator. We're going to be showing you how the parts go on it and how they come off. And hopefully by the end of the, the hour and a half, you'll all at least understand enough where you can go home and put it on the generator. Uh, we do help people that buy the plans. We normally help them by emails instead of phone calls because <laughs> there have been times where I've had 4,000 minutes a month on my cell phone. <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> so please, if you have a question, put it in short form on an email and clip a small picture to it so that I can see what the problem is that you want to address. If it's a simple question of I'm changing from gasoline to kerosene or diesel, address just that one issue. Uh, some of the people send me emails that are two and three and four pages long uh, and they could have answered the one little question in one little spot. Sometimes I only have a minute or two between things and I don't have time to read these long emails. So a few people here have sent me really long emails I haven't even responded to because if it's more than one or two sentences I'm not going to have time to do it. So try to keep your email short. Uh, if all of you know geekinternational.com is my website uh, and my email address is on there. There's a quick click for it. Now let's get right on to geek, what it is, why it does it, uh, and start through it. The first discovery I made was geek that really had importance to be able to calibrate what we were doing so we could make it a little bit more scientific instead of just shoving pieces together hoping it worked was when we discovered it had an aura. I toured the United States for about three years with my wife and as we were touring around so several of the places had metaphysical people there and they'd come over and pick the rod up and go, oh, it has such a beautiful aura. I don't see auras. I used to as a kid. I don't anymore. Yeah, well, if it's got an aura, then we got to get curly in photography. So we were at a show down in Laughlin, Nevada. And uh, when we got there, the guy had a plate. And people were walking over and putting their hands on the plate and it would change colors. And you'd say, well, the auric effect around there would explain uh, that you've got some problems with kidneys or liver or whatever. I'm watching this for a little bit. So let's see what happens if I throw the rod on there. So I asked him, can I throw a piece of metal on there? Said, for what? I said, I want to see if it has an aura. <laughs> sure, why not? So I put it down on the plate and the most beautiful blue aura all the way around it except the very ends appears on that metal plate. Well, I'm smiling going, hey, that is really great. Thanks. I walk back over to my booth and I see him over there throwing keys and change and his watch and rings. Can I see that rod again? Well, we showed him the rod again. He tried it a couple different directions. Then he held it up and took, did a Polaroid, special camera they have for the Berlin. He said, that thing's unbelievable. There's no yellow or orange. It's just beautiful blue all the way around it. That thing's really healthy. <laughs> For a while I started talking about the aura it had until I got to the Global Science Congress there and uh, there were a bunch of scientists there and MDs that really did not like the idea of me using the word aura. I said, why? I said, well, all of our books would be wrong if it's an aura. We said all these years that an aura can only be around living tissue, plants and animals, but not inanimate objects. Metal, glass, this can't be. I said, well, it's kind of like an aura. How about an orc effect? Can you guys live with that? Yeah, that's, that's acceptable. So we began realizing that a lot of the words that the other inventors here and myself were doing, we're taking a word that we think applies here without really knowing. And because of that, it becomes very confusing to the average person who's hearing this guy talking about the Aether field, and this one's talking about the Aether field, but are they really talking the same thing? Well, if they're not really talking the same thing, then they're using the same word in the wrong way. I didn't want to make that mistake, so I started going through the book saying, we're going to quit saying we have seven or eight magnetic or electric fields. We're going to say we have seven or eight unidentified energy fields. Let's be as precise as we can so that everybody can work on this at their own without having preconceived notions of what's happening. Now, there were seven people at the booth there with PhDs this week, 
they came over and played with the rod, with the compass, and when they saw the rod kept flipping over and over, they said, okay, you do have something. We, we don't know what it is, but you do have something. Uh, and it's obviously something we don't understand, and it's not in our book. But I also had to explain to one of the doctors who's, who took one of these home, uh, they said, if you can make that rod show a north here and a south here, and no matter how many times you turn the rod over, north is always up and south is always down. So there is a phenomenon here. Is it a magnetic field? No, it is not a magnetic field. A magnet, according to the definition in our science books, has the ability to pick up other metal and other things. It has no other qualities of a magnet, except it can draw a needle from a compass. It can tell you if whatever went through that chamber was what kind of fuel it was and whether the rod was the right size for it. And by studying, if you have pearl in photography machine, it's great. If you don't, compass works really good. You start at the top. You find north and you bring the compass down the rod until it shows a south. Where it shows south, if it's that long, it tells you the rod should have only been that long for the fuel you used. And it has a memory. Some of these rods I have are 10 and 15 years old. Some are older than that. But they still have the same memory of the last meal it had. That's pretty good memory. I can't show you what I have last. <laughs> During one of the shows in Pennsylvania, one of the people was playing with the rod, and the guy had, was in a wheelchair, one leg cut off. <laughs> he said, well, I hope this takes care of the pain way down here. <laughs> There's no leg there, but he's waving it out there. And I said, what pain? He said, I have phantom pains here all the time. Well, we sat there for about 45 minutes to an hour talking, and he's tapping it on his leg his thumb. After a little bit, he had to go to the bathroom, took off, came back, and he said, you know the damnedest thing? The bottom of my foot always itches. It isn't there. It quit itching. <laughs> and we said, oh, okay. He said, no. no. It took away the phantom. Instead of having the same aura that he's always had, it changed the aura. So, now we're trying to figure out, will this help other people with similar problems where they've had phantom pains for years and there's no limb there? We've had several people that have said if they carry the rod in their pocket, they quit having headaches. Uh, Aurora was here and she would like me to build her several hundred of these so that we can put these on nice little chains to put around your neck, smaller than this nice <laughs> But she, she'd like to make pendants out of them. Uh, we've had scientists from all over the country calling up saying, we want to buy a dozen rods charged. We want to study the rods. So we're going to start selling rods through some of our dealers that want to do that. I don't want to manufacture and distribute product. I'm a teacher. That's what I want to do. So by having my classrooms in Oklahoma, students from around the world come in and learn. If they become dealers as well, then they can go back in their community, like Mike and other people, and you can teach in your own community. You don't have to come to me. Is this rod a special material? That's a good point. Repeat no. The question. the question was, is the rod a special material? No. This rod, if you go to a hardware store, any hardware store will have a nuts and bolts aisle, and usually somewhere in that aisle or at the end of the aisle, you'll see a bin filled with little tiny rods, rod stock. They come in three or four foot pieces. You pull the size you need out, take the pipe you're going to use for a reactor chamber, slide it over the rod and say, yep, that's about the right size, and you buy that rod. So when you buy that three-foot piece of rod, you end up with enough rod to do about 15, 20 rods. Okay? Steel. One end of it, steel. which is cold rolled steel. Now, I've got about 50 uh, glass rods at the house. Uh, it's a little harder finding the glass rods. Uh, I don't like personally using the glass rods anymore because it has scared people really bad. Scientists seeing glass that has a magnetic field is bad enough. But when you build the entire chamber out of glass and anybody who knows about gasoline looks at it while it's running and they see lightning bolts shooting back and forth and a big ball of white light, 
all they can think of is boom! Gas vapor, lightning, explosion! Well, you don't have that in a vacuum. But the brain doesn't function that way. The brain sees lightning bolts and they run. <laughs> so I realized I was really scaring off a lot of people that wanted the geed because they were afraid of it. So we quit doing that. As we toured the country, we found the other phenomenon about the rod so that you don't ground, so that when you ground it, you don't draw in helicopters and FAA. Um, we also found if you don't ground it, you can't have a credit card in your pocket when you lean over it. Your credit card doesn't work. Now, some of us are a little bit more hard-headed than others, and sometimes I'm real, really stubborn. So, I'd be at a hotel like this doing demonstrations. I'd pick the engine up, put it up on a table, and my room card's right here, and I run the engine. Now my legs are sore at the end of the day, and I start walking back to my room, get back to the room, key doesn't work. Oh, darn it. Go back to the front desk, my key doesn't work. They try to reprogram it, hand it back to me. There you go, sir. I go back to my room, and it still doesn't work. I go back down, no, it didn't work. Third time. Finally, it dawned on me, wait a minute. I've wiped out the card, it can't be reprogrammed. Throw it in the garbage and say, may I have a new key? That worked every time. <laughs> so, when I realized this the best was Dr. Wood had come by my house to analyze what was happening, and he's had years, 35, 40 years, teaching automotive technology. And he's in the garage watching my engine run, totally blown away because we're running on crude oil and soda pop and everything else you could throw in a fuel tank. And as he hears the sound of a big engine go by, he turned and looked at him and said, Oh, Mopar, yeah! And he's telling me what kind of engine and everything about the engine as he's driving by. But he had gotten his wallet right next to the reactor, about that close to it. When he was all done looking at what I had, he said, You know what? I am so impressed. I'm going to go down and get a couple hundred bucks for you, just a donation to help you out. That would really be nice, thank you. Well, he takes off, I'm back about 30 minutes later. He says, I'm really embarrassed. Um, all my credit cards, I don't know what happened. None of them work. Oops. He says, what? I says, when you turn to watch the car go by, you got your wallet closed. He says, yeah, I did. I said, how much do you need to get home? <laughs> After I told that story in Denver, there was a guy from New York out here with his wife, and she kept wanting to go shopping. He wanted to be at the conference. And she kept, well, you want to buy those plans, I want to go shopping. He said, okay, just a minute. So he said, make your deal. Start that engine up right now at this booth. Let it run for about four or five minutes, and I'll buy the plans from you right now. Okay, so I start the engine up. He says, honey, come here. So she walks up to him, and he throws his arms up around. He says, let me take that over here. No, you don't need the purse right now. Give me a big hug. He's got the purse right up against the reactor. <laughs> Gives her a great big hug. And he says, now, you go shop. If you want, you can go spend two or 3000 I don't care. Get a nice coat. So she's walking out of there going, whoa, yeah, buy your plans. I don't care. Well, about three hours later, I'm done going over the plans with him, and I see her coming through the back door bags, wearing a beautiful fur coat. I'm sitting there going, oh God, he's going to want to beat the dickens out of me for this one. <laughs> As she walks up, she says, honey, look at, oh, you got, you're busy. When you, when you come up later, you got to say, I bought some new dresses, and I bought this, and I bought that. And the look on his face, oh, I'm so happy, dear. That's a beautiful coat. Oh, did you keep it within your budget? Yep. Just under 3000 Oh, he said, but the funniest darn thing, none of our credit cards work. He said, how the heck, on a weekend, we're from out of town, how could you get anybody in this town to take a check? He said, the temporary manager over at Macy's, he lives two blocks from us in New York. <laughs> Touche. He, he took a personal check. <laughs> So, uh, 
after she walked off with all of her winnings, <laughs> he looks at me and he says, now I'm in deep trouble. Start the engine again. That's for what? He says, if I don't erase my cards, it's going to look suspicious. <laughs> so, we have found that credit cards are wiped out very quickly if you do not have it grounded. To ground it means where the reactor is sitting, piece of copper wire clamped on down to the engine. That will ground it. It will not short out or wreck your credit cards. If you get a digital camera and you get really close to it, don't plan on ever using the camera again. I mean really close. Six, eight inches, you're in trouble. Uh, if you take a computer and take the rod and put it on top of your computer, don't plan on using it again. <laughs> we wrecked four of them in four days. Because my assistant, when he took the engine apart for people in my living room, would take the rod out and set it on top of my computer. <laughs> I didn't know it. I was in the other room doing other work. I'd come back in, the computer wouldn't even turn on. So I kept calling the guy, hey, there's something wrong with this computer. It won't turn on again. He came over, new switches, new circuits, and everything had to be replaced. He, he, none of the, nothing was usable. Now, years ago, I went to a conference up in Blaine, Washington, and Dr. Jean, or not Dr., uh, Jean Manning, an author, was present, and she and Dr. Malab and a few other scientists were there, and one of the scientists had been brought in to debug anyone who had anything to say about a new product or technology, and he was to play devil's advocate to prove that they didn't do their testing proper. And he was good. He has several of those PhDs coming off stage in tears. I'm sitting here going, okay, I'm a ninth grade dropout. What's he going to do to me? I mean, here he is ripping up all these PhDs. I'm in trouble. So when it got to be my turn on Wednesday, I got up in front of the crowd and I walked over with a felt pen and put it down in front of him. And I said, sir, I need your help here. Everybody here is going to be my class. Now, can you tell me where North is on the rod? And he said, up here. Would you take the felt pen and put an M? I said, well, I don't need to. There's a point on the other end. I said, would you please mark it? So there's no confusion. That's now class, in unison here. North is up. And everybody North said it. Is up. It worked. Is up. So then I turned the rod over like that and I said, now where is north? And he points up to the top, or to the bottom. I said, no, just a minute. Class, let's say it again. North, north is, is up. up. I said, now where is north? And he looked at me, and you could tell he was getting a little upset. <laughs> Pointed at the bottom again. It's okay. Now we'll do this again. Now, do you see where the needle is? He said, yeah. I said, now do you see where the needle is? Yeah. Where's north? Uh, uh, oh. Good. Now we're getting somewhere. But, you know, until you understand what I'm doing, we could have some communication problems here because you don't even know which end is up. <laughs> I embarrassed him and did a slam dunk on him so hard he did not open his mouth. For the entire time I stood at the podium, <coughs> he'd reach down, pick up the rod. Well, just before I handed him the rod to finally let him be quiet, I moved the rod past Jean Manning's camera, and her digital camera, which had pictures of all these speakers, was totally fried. The time it took to go past it like that, it drained the battery and fried its memory. And as I went by like that, she said, Oh, damn it, Paul, you did it again! I backed up and I handed him the rod. I said, what? He says, every time you get that rod near my camera, I lose another camera. I said, oh, jeez, I'm sorry. She said, no, no, no. This time I'm not going to let him take it and replace it with a new one. This one's going on my mantle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the rod can be made of glass. And that's a lot of fun just for the, the looks on a scientist's face or for entertaining your friends. It can be made out of any material, copper, brass, aluminum, it doesn't matter. What's fun though is with aluminum when you pull it out and you can fill them in north and south, everybody knows how magnetic aluminum is. <laughs> We've tried it in every configuration we could. We tried flat bar stock, we tried triangular square stock, we've tried machining them out, we've tried machining them so they have twists on them. We've wasted as much as $400 on one rod. 25 cents does just as good. Would be fair, I would like to caution your guests that that rod wants to float and suck itself in there, and if it's shaped right, they'll find that position. If they just 
Yes. Stay there and destabilize so and accelerate the city. Yes. It won't even move. Oh no, it has to move. Well, As you is the point angle critical? We don't know that either. That's another one of the specific tests. Uh, when you build it all out of glass so you can see what's happening, as you speed it up and you pick up velocity, this rod will actually move a little closer to the engine. It needs more heat to create more fuel, so it gets closer to the heat source. When you start slowing the engine down, it backs away to right where it wants to be for a perfect burn. Does the rod spin while the air oh, this the, spins like this? Uh, the University of Berlin uh, drilled into one of the bigger rods and they put a um, type of metal that they could detect from outside. Right, right. And they said they got to about 3,600 RPM. They couldn't read beyond it. That's what I would expect. Yeah. And they said when the engine hit 3,600 RPM, so was the rock. Mm -hmm. So we are getting a tremendous flow through that. There's a lot of people who said, oh, well, I put that rod in with that 32nd of an inch clearance. I mean, you can barely blow through there. Well, you're yeah. Much fuel. Well, you're not getting much fuel. The other thing is, well, if you look at the uh, carburetor on this one, here's the thing. Easily turn it the handle off that way so people can see better. The carburetor opening on this right now is smaller than a quarter of an inch. Normally it's about the size of a quarter. That's about the same size opening you need if you were powering a 350 Chevy. Now, when Dr. Grant Wood came to my home, and to my shops, we were running a 350 Chevy hooked up to about a 25 kW generator, and it was idling. And he stood there for about five minutes, and he said, I'm really in a hurry today, Paul. Would you please start the engine up? I said, it's running. And he looked over at it, and the fan blade is just barely moving. And he's questioning, and he goes over, and he touches the side of it, and he can feel some vibration. He looks at all these gauges, and he says, uh, the thermostat's not open, there's no heat. I said, no, the engine runs cold. Okay, but there's no vibration. And you're only running at 70 RPM. This engine can't run at 70 RPM. The engine doesn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it runs so smooth, I took a nickel out and set it up on top of the engine where it says firing order. I put it right up on the intake manifold and I balanced it, pulled my hand back, and the nickel stayed there. Now, if you can find another engine that runs that smooth, I'd like to see it. But we ran it for a few more minutes, and I said, you want to see something really interesting, get a glass of water. And get that glass of water, fill it up most of the way, and then set it on top of the engine. And what you see is a pulse in the dead center of the water on every stroke of the engine. No splashing, no wobbling back and forth. Perfect dead center every single time pulse. So I've never seen anything like this. You, you have something here. What is it? We're still trying to figure it out. Back then we were. If you'd have asked me in 1983, what is it? Beats the heck out of me, but it works. It, it's a pipe with a rod inside it and the exhaust goes around it. Did I need to know more than that? No. You want to buy one or not? And that was about the uh, bluntness of my sales pitch back then. Do you want one or not? Do you want to build one or not? Well, how'd you, for those of us who don't know a lot about this, how'd you find this, or how'd you discover it, or what led you to it? Uh, you can go on the internet to uh, Paul, period, or Paul Pantone Autobiography. Uh, the shortened version that uh, was put up is in there. Uh, it would, it's just a long story. Getting back to the rod, the only thing you really need to know to put it on a small engine is the type of fuel you're going to use. If you know you're going to be using gasoline, you say, okay, it's going to be seven and a quarter inches long if it's horizontal, or half that if it's vertical. Well, why would it take half that if it's vertical? Well, one of the anomalies we found is we're pulling electrons in from 60 feet away. When hot and cold go in opposite directions, there's an electrical discharge. It's like a cloud in the sky. When you've got hot and cold, they hit, you see lightning. Well, in here, you have the same phenomenon only the actual movement of the cold air swirling, which is your vapor and fuel, spinning through this rod at a high speed, because if you think, normal conditions, if you're pulling something through a tube like that, it's going to move straight through. Boy, was I wrong. It spins. 
And the more vacuum you put on it, the faster it spins. So the longer it takes for that fuel to get from point A to point B. Well, does one work better than the other? Vertical versus horizontal? Yes. Yeah. If it is horizontal, it takes twice as long to gather the number of electrons needed to break the fuel down. Because it can only draw the electrons from the air, 180 degrees. The minute you stand it up, you're drawing electrons from 360 degrees. It has the same field, I'm sorry, it has a similar field to a healthy planet. The rod has an axis, it has a north and a south, it allows air movement to go by it, the electrons are pulled into it, pulled to the south, and then shot up to the center, to the top. About the same diameter you have in the rod, that far from the end of this you should see a ball of white light, plasma. So after it's gone through all the spinning motion, it falls into this void. The energy is completely released. Now that new fuel is what goes to the engine. Dr. Grant Wood and Dr. Richter and a few other scientists tried to calculate out why we could get away with such a small hole for air. And they said the atomic reaction on some of the rods is very visible, where you can see it is broken in half at the halfway point of the rod. Something has happened, it's ripped apart. Well, that is a hottest point of the rod is the center. It is pulling the electrons in the hardest at that point. If you take a pyrometer and you're testing it, it's got a little red light, you can shine down on the surface, and all of a sudden the center of the rod, it'll spike two to five hundred degrees. The center of the rod will be hotter than the exhaust coming out of the engine. Well, this has got a lot of scientists sitting back going, wait a minute, how do you get more heat out here than you had to start with? And then you see ice sometimes sporting on the coming off the muffler. You're not supposed to have ice on a muffler. Maybe. The rod itself will allow the breakdown, but at the same time, instead of calling it a breakdown, let's look at what's happening. If you take vapor at 30 degrees here, 25, whatever the temperature of the vapor is at that high speed, and halfway down the rod, you can expand it to twice its size. So you start out here with, let's say, a cubic inch. Here it becomes two. At the next halfway point, it becomes four. At the next halfway point, it becomes eight. Whoa, you get a hundred expansions in four inches. So you've got more than enough air now for a big 350 engine. But it's also ripping the fuel apart and blending it with the air particles around it. So you've got a perfectly blended fuel going to that engine. It's taken 33 years to gather all this knowledge. Uh, some people have said, you know, your class is $3,500, that's a little too much for me right now. Well, when I'm at a show like this, I give a discount. If anybody signs up while I'm here, then it's going to be $2,500. If they want to be a dealer, they can talk to me as soon as we're done, we'll talk about dealership. They're going up after we get the next car batch out, where we can start offering a kit for a car. Not a kit, I'm sorry, I didn't qualify that. When we can offer the components that you can put on your own car then we are going to be raising the rate to $100,000 for a dealership. Currently it's $40,000. And there is a 20% discount for anybody who pays while I'm here. Now, knowing that the expansion is occurring started to help us to understand that certain fuels we were using were high in sulfur, which is an atomic weight of 32. Yet when we went to BYU, there was no sulfur coming out of the reactor. But there was helium. Helium is an indication of an atomic reaction. So, there you go. it works. We don't know why it works, but we got a lot of oxygen coming out the tailpipe, more than there is in the room, and we got helium that isn't in the room. And there's no scientific explanation on where any of this thing came from other than transmutation. It was at that point that Dr. Stephen Jones turned towards me and said, Mr. Pantone, this is just as fantastic as when we have Hans and Fleischmann here at that machine and he turns and points towards it. He says, right there is where we prove cold fusion works. I said, wait a minute here, guy. I thought the position was you guys didn't have any evidence of cold fusion. He says, no, 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 no. He says, that's outside this room. <laughs> <laughs> the man who writes my paycheck said it doesn't work, so when I get out of this room, I have to say it doesn't work just like you. So we went through three days of testing, you're not going to be able to talk about it? He said, I can't. 
anything that threatens our academic community would shut our doors. You can't talk about this. Well, I'm really not too fond of the group that at BYU, so I was a little upset over those comments. So I went to the Deseret newspaper and I said, hey, I need a hand. I'd like to get an article about what I just did down at BYU. But they're going to deny it. So, are you a pretty good reporter? He says, oh, I know how to get a story out of them. Let me work on it. So he calls him up and says, uh, Dr. Jones, is it, is it true that Mr. Pantone had an atomic reactor in your office? No, it is not an atomic reactor. Oops. <laughs> now, do you want to tell us what you think it is, or should I just print that? They did the same thing with U of U and a few other people that claimed, oh, we don't know Paul Pantone. Oh, we've never seen that device. But we had to trap them into telling the truth. And I'm glad there's some good reporters in those areas, because sometimes that's the only way you're going to get to it. They don't want to talk about it. You've got to word your questions very carefully. Now, you were asking about direction. The rod north versus uh, horizontal versus vertical. If you're in a vehicle or on a lawnmower or anything that's moving around in different directions, if this needs to be pointed north to work, you can only run your car in that direction to be efficient. The minute you turn your car, you're going to lose efficiency. When you're going the wrong direction, it's really going to drop. It's going to drop by 20% of efficiency. But if you're getting double, who cares? If it's this direction, you're going to get consistent efficiency. So it makes a lot more sense. This way you can turn your car any direction you want to go. Unless, of course, you're going up a tree, then you're in trouble. How, how quickly does it uh, get the memory that we're talking about? It takes 32 minutes. 32 minutes? 32 minutes. 32 minutes to have full memory. But it starts working immediately. It will have a gate reaction instantly. When you first pull it, you have a little extra vacuum to get it started the very first time, and it creates a field of immediately. Now, we have a big generator that uh, I left in Utah because I didn't want to haul 18,000 pounds anymore. I left a quarter megawatt power plant at my ex in laws And uh, that one had ice on the exhaust pipe about 15 or 20 times during demonstrations. Uh, one of the demonstrations was for Utah power, Bonneville power, Tennessee Valley flew in, and uh, Nevada power. And they spent the whole day there. We ran the engine for them on all kinds of things. They had their own analyzers. And they said they didn't want to report back what they'd seen there because uh, right now we're too tied into coal and oil and different things and fuel and we can't do anything more than a 5% increase in efficiency or we're going to be disruptive and we're going to have enemies, big enemies. So they wanted something that would only increase the efficiency of the power plant up to 5% but reduce the emissions by as much as you can. I could reduce emissions to zero, but when you get to zero, you're getting better than double or triple. You're going to be a lot more efficient than that. So there's a compromise, and they said, no, we can't have a compromise. we got to reduce emissions without increasing the efficiency. So we can keep wasting fuel. So we've had a problem there. Uh, now, in America, the biggest problem I had for the first 10 years of selling plans is people in this country want more horsepower. People in Europe are going, we want more economy. We don't mind losing 10% of the horsepower if we can get triple. We don't mind 25% loss. We want better mileage because we're paying a lot more for fuel than you guys are. And here it's always, nope, got to have more power. Got to have more power. Okay. Um, we've had a few guys that were insisting on it, so we went ahead and taught them how. And I'll show you on this little one when we put it up on the table. You can put a pump in the system. But if you do, be careful what you wish for. I have had the 10 horsepower engine booked up to our analyzer with scientists in the room and mechanics that when we revved it up to over 12,000 RPM, they all hit the floor or hit the door real fast. They're scared to death that there isn't going to be anything left. We've never blown an engine up yet with that. But it sure is fun. But my favorite thing is when you've got couples. The women will stand right next to me. And the guy's over on the other side of the bench with all the equipment. And when I rev it up, the women still stand there. They don't know any better. It sounds like a sewing machine. Hey, that's nice. 
she quietens out after a little RPM. But the husbands are diving under benches, diving out the door, running down the street. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. But I really don't like scaring people. I'd much rather give a presentation that is proper, and therefore I don't use glass in demonstrations. We've got too many people that are afraid to use light. Can I ask a question? Yes. Are there same rules to your children? We have the same problems in Europe and the United States and Canada that the government does not want it on vehicles, but if you're going to put it on your own car or your own equipment and you're not going to sell the equipment, it's all right, but they really grumble. But if you go any better than the 50% or 60% increase, you will have problems. They will confiscate the vehicle. They do not want high mileage vehicles. People have big mouths. The only reason those three guys are dead from years ago is they opened their mouth. Well, how are you fighting in California? The uh, Like right now, I've got a 1991 diesel that's never had to be smogged, and this year I got my thing in the mail that I got to smog it. Oh. What county you live in? Stanislaus. And all the smog is is just an inspection, but they want to make sure that you didn't put anything else on that. Well, yeah. I hope they don't do that like it. Have a, uh, a hybrid vehicle that doesn't require smog at all. So, I, mean, I know that that doesn't work there. Yeah. If you have a hybrid, you never have to get a smog anyway. So. I mean, they're talking about like a 73 or under. Or, or under doesn't have to be smog, but they're even talking about putting a smog on those to be inspected for devices. Uh, the EPA. Oh, what they think. California, what can I say? Now, don't feel bad. It's just as bad here. I have two vehicles. I cannot drive on the road because they don't pass smog and they have brand new engines. Yeah. Right now, there's about uh, 15, 20 cars that are made in foreign countries that cannot be sold in this country because the mileage is too good. So, it's nothing new. Uh, EPA, uh, when I first approached them and told them I did not want to have to go through years of testing, like Dr. Grant Wood and all these other people, they were trying to get their carburetors fast, and they knew that they had at least two years head start on me. And then I called Dr. Wood up one day and I said, pal, I cut through all the red tape. We can start putting these on cars today. And Dr. Wood said, no, you can't. I said, yes, I can. I got a letter from EPA. I got a couple of them. And we even got resumes from some of their top people. Said, what is the letter? I said, it says that they're a voluntary organization and they do not have the legal right to endorse, approve, or certify anything. They're glorified reporters for Congress. So if they come out and ask us anything, we don't even have to talk to them. And if they represent that they have any legal authority, we can have them arrested by the U.S. Marshal and prosecuted. But how does that circumvent the DMV and the fact that you in have California, to send a smog certificate to, from the smog station to DMV in order to get your license? It's a big bully. Big bully. In California, there was a uh, director of CARB called uh, Ruth Costa for years. And Ruth Costa started telling people that Paul Pantone is a fraud. She got me really mad after I heard that. And, and I called up there and I talked to her. And I said, before you tell me anything, let me explain to you. I'm taking the call. I do that a lot. I have an attitude problem with officials. And uh, my attitude problem with her is we're telling people slanderous comments that should have put her in prison, but I was being a nice guy to give her a warning. I told her I was going to California, and if I wanted to run my car on water or pee or anything else, I'd do it. And I dare her to come out and give me a ticket or cite me or threaten me. And if she told anybody else that they couldn't put this on their car, I would file suit against the state of California. And now, do you understand that it's a voluntary program and I'm not volunteering? And she says, yes, sir, I do. Do you think you can refrain from making any comments about me or my company? Yes, I can. Would you like to come down and see it? No, no one from the state will be there. Is the carb different than the feds? Yeah, it is. But I started with the feds. They're the ones who told me carb had no legal authority. They've been bullying people into believing they do. They set up the Air Quality Control Board. It's nothing more than a way that Brown and Brown of Beverly Hills could control all small controlled equipment in the state of California. And they sucked the Californians into it. They told them they were putting smog pumps on their cars. Why? Because the law was passed when a certain Brown was in office that said 
No car can be sold in this state unless you have a 50% reduction in emission by a certain date. Well, uh, none of the car companies could do it. Uh, Brown's firm says, yeah, you can. Put a slug pump on there, and it'll pump 50% more air in the pipe, and you're going to have half the pollution. <laughs> we fell for it. Yeah, everybody's got to have one now. And I wonder how many millions they've made in royalties per year. I'm sorry. It's all dirty politics. It's all, it's, it's, the whole thing is dirty politics. So We've had solutions we for 100 our, years. Uh, how do we get our uh, slightly uh, enhanced uh, vehicles to pass this uh, committee? You go in and get rejected. Now, at my school, I do have copies. I've got volumes of books. But I have copies of the refusals when they said, failed smog test, zero emission. You take that to the state and say, excuse me, I didn't have any emissions, and I got failed. You need to give me a waiver. They give you a waiver. Thank you. And even in California, if your car pollutes too much, and you spend 300 or 350, whatever the magic number is, trying to fix it and you don't, they'll still give you a waiver, and you can drive your polluter down the road. But Four walk feet. in there and tell them you're too clean, they're going to put you to the seventh degree. <laughs> so you just tell them it didn't pass. Mm -hmm. They don't have to look at the no. numbers. No. Some of them will come out. i got to see it. <laughs> now in Utah they pulled the same stuff with me and the guy there in the uh, Utah Air uh, was telling people they couldn't put it on the car. And when I called him up I taped that conversation and I told him I'm taping him and I said it's the only way I can deal with people like you. But you have no legal right to say that. If you say it again I'm going to prosecute you personally, severally. I will own your home. Now, is that what you want? Uh, this isn't a threat. This is a promise. I don't like idiots that lie. And I, he was getting madder and madder. He said, Mr. Cantone, you're correct. Bring your papers in. We'll, we'll prove whatever papers you have. We know it works. When they test, do they, do they have to look under the hood or just, just check the tail? If you have modified it from factory equipment, they have to look at it to be able to say, yes, it has been done. They have to have a reason for a waiver. Yes? What's, uh, where do you put the product? We've got about 45 minutes We're going to take... Huh? So we got about 45 minutes left. And we've got to some well, we're going to be pulling it apart here shortly. Uh, do you want to grab the tools? Sure. So you can take... Kind of. Oh, we're going to start the engine up first, let it run for a few minutes, and we'll go ahead and take one apart. So you're going to need to turn the camera over towards this little engine here. We can set it set it back about three feet so everybody can see. No, when we take it apart, I'll put it back up on the table. We're just going to run it a few minutes. Right here? Yeah. Do you have gas in it? Last time we put a little bit in. Sir, can I get you to cheat, cheat towards the camera so you're not you're back? Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. about what you're doing, why you're doing it? Okay, well, there's two valves here. One's the throttle and one's the air intake. You gotta open those up a little bit. <coughs> Go. The valve at the far end <coughs> allows fresh air to be sucked into the bubbler, down to the center of the bubbler at the bottom. It then bubbles through whatever liquid you have in there. When the vapor comes off the top of it, it's pulled by the other two into the bottom of the exhaust pipe. Up to the center of it, there's another rod right inside the pipe. The exhaust comes out of the engine, travels about six inches, comes down, and comes out here, and exits right here. Now, when we got here yesterday, uh, we pulled that rope and filled the entire cylinder with sugar, soda pop, gas, and whatever oils were in there, because someone had switched my hoses around. And in 33 years, nobody had ever done that. So it was somebody that was at my home before it got loaded up to come to this show. So somebody did not want me to run the engine. 
Luckily, we have somebody here with some tools. Didn't mind taking them apart and cleaning it up so we can run it. And put the hoses back right. So you should be able to start that up usually one or two pulls. Too much air? Nice pulls in now a little. Yeah, about there. Go ahead. Without touching the valves, people can come by and look to see how far open each one of the valves are. Those will give them a good idea. Then once it cools down, we'll put it up on a bench and we'll take it apart. But this will give you an idea of the amount of airflow you need when you're running it. What's what's the fuel that's in there? Uh, right now, how much of the soda pop did you pour out? Any? I, could, I didn't pour out any soda pop. Oh, no, you didn't. I put about an ounce. It is warm. Put about an ounce of fuel in there. Gasoline, soda pop, and soda pop, oil, coffee, and sugar. Another brownie. Soda pop, coffee, and so we put all kinds of nasty things down in the bottom of the water. In that water, this is the water with a little bit of gas. If you're doing it for an automatic feed, you have different carburetor on there. It's reacting. It's reacting here with the exhaust comes out here. Yep. The, the gas goes this way inside of the exhaust pipe, totally isolating from the exhaust, um, and then into the engine. Okay. The exhaust goes this way. Oh, I see. So and then yeah. so there's, so there's a pipe that. inside of there. And then there's even and the rods inside, inside that pipe inside of this pipe. There's rods. Rod. There's three layers. Why? It's just for make it compact. Put it all together like that. Or so maybe you can have the three layers like that. Is no, you, well the three layers in the opposing directions of the gas flow and the exhaust flow mm -hmm. creates that negative field, oh. which creates the reaction. Oh, wow. So you can see the Yes. So the exhaust comes out of here. Yeah. We have to run from down to out. It's a great so fresh and the gas line is so fresh and it sucks the fumes off the top. The mechanics of this is kind of runs it through and then, then, then like a wiki leak or something like that. It has the so ability to so open so the cast so things that are supposed to be grabbed. That's just yeah. fumes. Yeah. yeah, so it draws it from the top of the jug. Not from the bottom. So it's just taking in the fumes. Most of the planet. That's it's created by the bubbling It would also be using an EM4 snap. So, okay. so then that comes through and then it penetrates the exhaust, but it isolated completely from so they're not intermingling. It would be a totally you know, isolated from each other. It is better to do it out slowly. Because um, is it too inside of him? Yeah, so this and these threads are drilled out. Don't get your computer in your Okay. Well it's not running. Well, where is it? Oh, let me check and see if it works. Well, <laughs> you computer there. Oh, the rod no. by itself took on the computer. Probably. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. It's good. We'll get back to putting it on the bench here in just a minute. We had a couple questions that were thrown at me. Okay. What was your question again? Uh, first of all, what about the wear on the or on the engine? <laughs> wear on the engine. We've been getting about 10 to 15 times the life out of an engine compared to normal expected life of the engine. The original 10 horsepower engine, which has over 7,000 hours on it, according to Briggs and Stratton, should run about 600 hours. But that was providing I changed the oil at least once every eight hours. I've never changed the oil. Uh, my Suburban, I drove it 85,000 miles. I never changed the oil. One of my mechanics, uh, Mike Holler, decided he was going to change the oil for me one day and do me a favor because we had come in from the long trip. And he also realized there was a hole in the radiator hose. It looked like somebody had stabbed it. So he took the hose off and put a new hose on. And when I came out to the garage, I said, what are you doing? He said, well, there was a hole in your radiator hose. I said, yeah. 
I did that when we started the trip to prove to people the engine never heats up. <laughs> oh, if the radiator, the thermostat never opens, you don't need a radiator. And on diesels, we didn't need a radiator. But you also don't have heat. You need an electric heater in your car. We found that out the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> in Lansing, Michigan, we had to get a hair dryer to defrost the windshield while a couple guys ran down and bought us a couple little tiny heaters we could put on the floorboards. So <laughs> there are drawbacks. Be careful what you wish for. We want a good mileage, and we got it. The, the exhaust, if you have the perfect length rod for the fuel you're using, should have zero heat coming out of it should be the same temperature as the ambient air. If you aren't getting a perfect burn, you're either going to have ice on it or you're going to have heat. Now you use this on both carbureted and fuel injected engines? On anything that uses fuel, even boilers and furnaces. Does the motor have to be a full compression ratio? No. Well, the big engine we demonstrated for uh, the power companies when they came to my home is a V8. The piston's seven and a quarter inch. It's a walker chop. Uh, my brother-in-law was supposed to be helping me that day and I asked him to take all the old funky looking wires off the spark plugs and change it to new spark plugs. It was a diesel that had been converted to natural gas. We could left the spark plugs on it and I told him to change all the plug wires off. He took all the plug wires off about a half hour before Fox News got there. Then went to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't realize he hadn't put the plug wires back on, so when Fox got there, I went out and gave them a demonstration. I had my heat gun and showed him the temperature of the engine after running 20, 30 minutes still wouldn't go up one degree. Well, as I'm doing the demonstration, and I'm checking it, all of a sudden I realized it had gone up two degrees. Well, we don't have a radiator, so I'm worried now, you know, there's heat here. Well, the next day my brother-in-law pointed out to me, there was no heat. There was no entrance. The sun had moved over from this side of the engine to this side of the engine, shining down on dark, a bright or a dark uh, blue paint. And the dark blue paint absorbed the heat. So we were not heating the engine up by running it. It was the sun moving over and hitting it directly. So uh, while we were running it, though, they finally said they had enough footage of that. They wanted to go see the tractors and the cars and everything else. We had a Ford Pinto at the time that was getting 88 miles a gallon. So we went ahead and shut the engine down. As our cameraman was putting his great big camera back in his box, he said, yeah, I got a dumb question for you. I, I was a diesel mechanic for years. I've worked on a lot of these. But why on earth would you go through the trouble of having, you know, magneto and, and all the coils and putting spark plugs in it if you didn't hook up any wires? <laughs> I, mean, I was so embarrassed it wasn't funny. I looked over at the engine and said, oh, no. He forgot, wait, it ran. It ran. <laughs> I go over there and I hit the starter button and get it started right up. <coughs> I'm like, wow, I didn't know it would run without wires. Well, you learn something. Sometimes you may look at it as a mistake at the time, but later you can sit there and laugh about it. So that was just before we were going to take our trip across the United States. Now, this brother-in-law was also a certified Mr. Goodrich mechanic which is one reason I didn't want to hire him at first, but because he was related, I said, all right. <clears throat> but he decided he was going to tune up our Suburban so we could take our trip. He went out and hooked up his timing light, loosened up the distributor, reached in, turned it on, came out, grabbed his timing light, and he starts moving the distributor cap back and forth. 180 degrees. And it isn't changing the running at all. So he's a little confused. So he puts the timing light down, goes back inside the cab, and he turns the key on. The engine is still running. Now he's out looking at it, goes back in, checks it, keys off. Distributor's just spinning back and forth. Um, and it's still running smooth. Um, the key's off. I should be able to pull the spark plug wires off. And it's still running. So he pulled all eight torque plug wires and the coil wire off, came in, he said, I got a problem. I said, what's that? I told you not to tune it up. Didn't need it. He said, well, it won't shut off. I said, really? It does for me. He said, well, I guess I just don't know how. I said, that's probably that badger on your 
<laughs> so I go out, and while he's looking under the hood, shaking his head, I kill the vacuum. I opened up the air intake on top of the engine, which is hidden behind an air cleaner so he couldn't see what I was doing. But when I opened it up, the engine died. Then I set it right back to the right <laughs> position so to restart. I said, there you go. But it wasn't supposed to be running. Well, let's see if it'll run. And he didn't have time to say the plugs are off. He'd already mentioned that they were loose. <laughs> well, I go in and hit the key and start it right up. <laughs> Piece of cake. Doesn't sound like it needs a tune up. Do you want to shut it off so I can put the wires back on? Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. So I shut it off, set the switch right back to where it had to be, and I went in the house. As I'm going through the door, he's throwing his cap on the ground, tools are flying. <laughs> Is there a problem? He's, nope, nope, everything's fine. I just like it when people mess with me. You could have told me, I told you what? You could have told me it can't be tuned. I said, you tune it by the rod. And you control it by vacuum. Kill the vacuum, it kills the engine. Instead of turning the switch off just now, I took all the air away. I could have shut the fuel or the air off and it would have killed the engines. God would give me many gifts and I would know I'm on the right track because 21 years from that day, scientists would be kneeling before me in Congress seeking knowledge. And when she said that, I laughed. <laughs> you got the wrong person. <laughs> scientists are not going to be on their knees in front of me asking for knowledge. Boy, was I wrong. It sure felt good. But at first, that little bad side of me kind of popped yeah. out because this one scientist for three and a half days went around that conference telling everybody I was a fraud and he was going to expose me if it was the last thing he did well Dr. Malov was there and a few other doctors that I did know and they were all chuckling about it they were all betting him <laughs> <laughs> they already knew it worked <laughs> it was an easy flick in here so they're saying, yeah, I'll bet you 200. You, you want to bet more? Okay, I'll bet you four. <laughs> Eugene comes over and he's a problem. We're done with this demonstration. You blow his socks off and I'll buy two of your engines. One for each side of my desk. Yeah, so that sounds good. So we get in the classroom. I'd already heard that he was going to prove I was a fraud, so I got him front and center here. We went through an hour and a half lecture and I said, let's go out and play with the engines. And you, sir, would you be my assistant? He gets up going, yeah, I'd be your assistant. Good, that's the spirit. So we all go outside. There's about 150 people packed around us. I pour in some soda pop, some coffee, four bags of sugar. I said, now, when I start, give me just a second. Oh, when I start this up, your job, sir, is to put your hand over the muffler area here with Kleenex and pass the Kleenex out into the audience so people can see and smell what the exhaust is. Okay? Yes. Good. So I start the engine up. He's got a box of Kleenex there. He's on one knee and his foot, and somebody bumps into him as they're going around. It was just elbow to elbow. He starts to fall over, and as he does, puts one hand down on the pavement, the other one right on the muffler. Well, he pulls up as fast as he can and stops, and he touches the muffler a couple more times, and he says, what, what is this? And I looked at my wife and I said, now it's time to get even. And I looked down at him and I said, that's a muffler. <laughs> he looked at it back up and he said, I know it's a muffler, but it's ice cold. Isn't it supposed to be? No, it's supposed to be hot. <laughs> really? The engine doesn't know that. <laughs> he jumps up and here is this short little stocky German guy shaking and I, I'm look I there's no place to run I mean, oh no I'm gonna get lights out well he's standing there shaking he said, you you are making a fool of me in front of all of my colleagues I said no you're doing a good job all by yourself you don't need me help <laughs> he took off back in that building and damn near ripped the door off the hinges going in but about an hour and a half later he saw me sitting over in the lounge with a bunch of other scientists and he left his bag in the middle of the lobby and walks over to me looking down. I said, oh, come on, join us. I said, no, I must come to apologize. Someone with my credibility should never lose their cool like I did. I, I am a complete fool. I said, no, you're not. I think your friends took advantage of you. 
because most of them knew I work, that my product works. This is, but I should have been smarter than I was. I am a doctor. Says, ah, we all make mistakes. Why don't you come join us? He says, no, I'm too embarrassed. I'm going home. But thank you. I needed that. No one has ever put me in my place like you do. <laughs> well, he left. I even got up and gave him a hug. I said, hey, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings that bad. I, I really wanted to get even. You did. Well, after he left, my wife says, honey, remember when Mrs. Cunningham told you scientists would be kneeling before you in Congress seeking knowledge? And what did you do? Beat him up? Oh, jeez. You know, that really wasn't very nice of me. <laughs> I could have done it nicely. I didn't. So we all make mistakes. I've learned from that one. Uh, I try not to beat up people when they're standing there saying, what is it and why does it work? Uh, I wouldn't do that to a kid, so why should I do that to a scientist? These engines, when they start getting 10 times their normal life, uh, we have manufactured, Bridge and Stratton flew me at all expenses with my wife and my son back to Wisconsin so we could test for a whole week in their laboratory. We need to get out of here very quickly. Why? Said, well, we have people here that might pick up the phone and call the government because if they find out you're here and you've got this, they're going to seize it. Because you're kidding. He's no, follow me. And he takes me down, the vice president of R&D, takes me down to their conference room in the research center. And he's pointing at cars and motorcycles on the wall. He says, we have vehicles way back that we get 100, 150, 200 miles a gallon. They're all buried underneath this slab. We can't even talk about it outside this one. You've got to be kidding me. You know, the government tells us how many miles to the gallon we're going to get. They tell us how much pollution we're putting out. That's why we haven't changed the engine in 100 years. Well, after I left there, a newspaper reporter called them years later and said, did you guys did a test with Paul Pantone on such and such a date? Nope, never heard of the man. So when they gave me the warning I had to get the hell off the property quickly or the government was coming in to seize it, I had a big red badge, which I still have today. And it said, Visitor Pass, signed by the president of the company and the vice president of the company. I dropped that in the box before I put my engine in the box. When we got to the gate, they said, where's your, where's your badge? Oh, I must have left it in there. Well, I'll leave the car here and I'll go get it. And there's a line of cars. Everybody's getting off work. No, get out of here. I got away with that badge. That was the only proof I had that I was there. But when the reporter called me back and he said, you're trying to con me. You, you were never there. I said, really? And that was a Marin Independent Journal. So I drove down to their office, walked in, I handed them the pass. I said, then you tell me how I got their signature on there. Okay, we have a story, front page. He said, I want that back right now. You can have a copy. He said, oh, I want a copy of it. And he called him back saying, now, let me refresh your memory. You got a fax number? Let me fax it to you. They blew up and said, that's, that's proper, proper. You, you have no legal right to have that. That's our property. We want our badge back. Said, no, no, you don't understand. You lied to me. And we're going to print that in the paper, too. They were told not to report anything publicly to anybody, only to the government. And for that, they sell a lot of engines on paper that never get delivered to the military. We're talking millions of engines. They get paid for them, they never have to deliver them. That was part of their payment for keeping secret. Now let's see if we balance up here. <laughs>